Creamer Media's Mining Weekly is interviewing Robert Forrest, the Chief Technical Officer and co-founder of Materials Nexus, which has just announced that the use of an artificial intelligence-based materials discovery platform to create a permanent magnet that does not contain any rare earth. Hi, Robert. It's great to chat to you. How rare is it to have a permanent magnet that does not contain a rare earth element? Well, that's a great question. There are mainly five groups of magnetic material that have been discovered since maybe the, the beginning of the, the 1900s. Um, two of those are rare earth elements containing compositions. So things like neodymium ion boron and samarium cobalt. The majority of the other magnets that are in use do not contain rare earth elements. So these are things like Alnico and your ferrite magnets, which are very widely used. So it's actually uh, more common to have magnets which don't include rare earth elements, but those magnets are usually much lower performance than what you can get with rare earth element containing magnets. The downside is, however, that the rare earth elements are extremely uh, costly to get hold of, uh, both in terms of economics and the environment. You have to do strip mining and a lot of expensive processing to separate out the ores. But those rare filaments are crucial to, to getting the, the kind of high magnetic performance that we see. The other magnets that we're talking about, these things like ferrite magnets, uh, these are more common in things like fridge magnets and very low uh, performance um, speakers and, and headphones and things like this. What is rare, however, um, is to discover a magnet at all. So there haven't been any kind of innovations in the magnetic space for maybe 40 years since neodymium ion boron was discovered in the late 1970s, early 1980s. So what we're trying to demonstrate here is that uh, we can do in record time this whole materials discovery process. We've done this in three months um, versus the decades and hundreds of millions of dollars that it usually takes to go from the idea or the, the accidental discovery of something to commercialization. What proof can you put forward that your rare earth-free magnet, permanent magnet, is a genuine permanent magnet? So as part of the work that we've done on Magnex, we've worked with experimental collaborators at the University of Sheffield and the Royce Institute. Uh, they performed measurements of the composition after they casted it, uh, and it does meet the kind of standard uh, criteria that you'd expect to see uh, with the coercivity remnants BH max uh, that you would expect to see with a permanent magnet. This is also backed up by the detailed quantum mechanical modeling of the composition that we did prior to the experimental work. So the experimental work is really validating what our technology was able to do in terms of the modeling. In terms of the, the parameters that we were interested in uh, for optimizing for this permanent magnet, we were interested in the polarization, the strength of the magnet, the um, coercivity, or by proxy, the hardness of the magnet. Uh, we're also interested in the price per kilogram and the fact that it doesn't contain rare filaments. So our searching algorithms, which were identifying the composition, were targeting these four things. And this modeling was then validated by the experiment. And what impact, in your view, could this discovery potentially have on rare earth mining? Should it remove the need for rare earth in permanent magnets? So I obviously appreciate the role played by the rare earth mining industry in the economy, particularly towards uh, net zero technology. There's a huge amount of net zero technology, which is enabled by the mining and processing of rare earth elements. And there are a huge amount of applications for rare filaments outside of just the permanent magnet space. Uh, there's a huge amount of applications in nuclear power, um, laser gain materials, magnetocalorics. Uh, so even if a new contender such as Magnex enters the magnetic space, there is still a lot of room for rare filaments to, to be exploited in other areas. And demand for rare filament is projected to outpace supply for some significant amount of time, even with a lot of effort that's going into creating new mines and getting access to more supply. Um, so we are entering with this disruptive new material. We're not expecting to monopolize the whole magnets uh, market in one go, but um, we do see that this will provide supply chain security for people who are having to rely on very fragile rare element, element supplies. What do you mean by high performance permanent magnets? So there are a variety of metrics that you can determine the performance of your magnet by. We're interested in things like the coercivity, which is how much effort it takes to change the magnetization of the magnet. You want that to be very high in a permanent magnet. 
And we're also looking at the remnants, which is how much magnetic field remains in the magnet after you've magnetized it, which indicates how strong it's going to be. Uh, we're interested in the energy product, BH max, which is the, the product of the remnants and the coercivity, which indicates how much energy there is in the magnetic field per volume of magnet. And with smaller magnets, you can have higher BH max and get the same performance as with larger magnets. So optimizing that is very important. We're also interested in the operating temperature of the magnet. So um, things like samarium cobalt, they can go to very high temperatures. Things like a neodymium ion boron can't quite match that. So there's a different kind of application that we're interested in trying to match that, that kind of operating temperature above 200 degrees Celsius. Outside of just the performance metrics for the magnet, there are sort of secondary metrics, things like the price per kilogram. Obviously, we want to minimize that such that this is a very widely accessible and usable magnet formula. Uh, and we're also interested as part of our primary mission at Materials Nexus in the carbon cost, how much kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of magnet is produced. And we want to minimize that as well. And how do you define net zero? And what facts back up your statement that Magnex is a net zero material? So to me, net zero means the major reduction in CO2 emissions as part of some manufacturing process. With any remaining CO2 emissions after you've minimized all that you can being offset uh, by things like removal, carbon capture or forestation. Our analysis suggests of our new material magnex that we would have a 70% reduction uh, in CO2 equivalent emissions versus neodymium ion boron. So this is a, a really major step towards uh, a net zero economy relying on magnetic materials that you simply can't access with rare earth element uh, derived magnets. Um, this also would have knock-on effects in other industry that's supporting the uh, transition towards the green economy. And so if you have wider access to more sustainable magnets and things like your wind turbine generators or your electric vehicle motors, this means that you can, you can roll that part of the economy out at a far faster, more accessible rate than you can with rare earth element based magnets. Uh, and so accelerate that part of the green transition as well. And why do you state that your artificial intelligence, your AI platform, is redefining material discovery? So traditional materials discovery, as it's currently done, is based on trial and error experimentation. Um, so you have some empirical understanding of your current material, current product, and you're making very small changes to it to try and improve things. A lot of the time, you won't know for sure why the things that you're changing have an impact, uh, what the mechanism is physically for that for that impact, uh, why adding maybe a bit of copper here and a bit of nickel there changes the properties in the way that you want it to. And this clearly means that it's a very inefficient and slow process. Uh, so it takes decades and, as I've said, hundreds of millions of dollars to go from the idea to the, the commercial product. Um, what we're doing is trying to redefine that process by taking the trial and error experimentation out of the lab and into a high throughput computational screening environment, uh, which is underpinned by the advanced quantum mechanical modeling that we can do and the really high throughput, accurate uh, machine learning models that we have that are able to map chemistry to material properties. This allows us to analyze millions of candidates at rates that are just impossible in the physical laboratories. Um, so we're really, we're trying to migrate from the laboratory, uh, that environment in the real world being a place not only for inquiry, but mainly for validation of what we're predicting with the technology. And your AI platform is said to be 200 times faster. 200 times faster than what? So, uh, as I mentioned, the kind of traditional materials discovery approach is based on trial and error. If we look at uh, competitors in the markets that have existed there for some time, uh, you can track their progress of development from their initial discovery to where they are now after they've been refined. And that could, takes decades, um, 50 years or so for, for some of the candidates out there. We've done this kind of work in three months where we've gone from the, the first idea to the uh, material that we've cast and have confirmed in the laboratory to be a permanent magnet. And so that difference between the 50 year mark and the three month mark is where we get this idea of us being 200 times faster. What are the supply chain and environmental issues that you say Magnex addresses? Magnex does not contain any rare earth elements in its composition. Uh, this means that necessarily the composition is far more widely available and cheaper than things like neodymium ion boron and samarium cobalt. 
um, you also don't have the same kind of mining practices that are required for getting access to rare earth elements. So you have a completely different framework for the rest of the transition metals and things like this. It's also known that, for example, with the rare earth elements, picking neodymium as an example, you have 200 tons of toxic waste produced per ton of neodymium that's processed. This is a, a figure that dwarfs the majority of the other material uh, or elements that you're going to get access to today. None of the elements that are in our Magnex material have this kind of sustainability issue. And I've mentioned already the 70% reduction in CO2 emissions that we are predicting to get access to with Magnex. And how financially competitive is Magnex? And is it proving itself in the field? So we predict that Magnex is going to be around 50% cheaper per kilogram than it is uh, to get access to neodymium-based magnets. And this will have knock-on impacts throughout the high-tech industry. Um, so access to a 50% cheaper component with uh, performance that matches what you need it to um, makes the resulting technologies that you're building, again, far cheaper and more readily available. You'll have the ability to make more wind turbines, more electric vehicles, and get those out to the market at a far faster rate, a rate that's closer to what we need it to be for the transition to the net zero green economy to be successful and actually help us um, defeat climate change and save the save the planet. And what kind of collaboration has this discovery received from the Henry Royce Institute and the University of Sheffield? Yeah, so we're very excited to be working with the Royce Institute uh, and the University of Sheffield. They are very well respected, best in class experts in the material space. Uh, they have a lot of academic and technical know-how, particularly around metal processing. The work that we've done with them in this collaboration focuses on the actual creation of the material candidate that we were interested in that became Magnex. Um, there was no adjustment made to the output of the platform uh, on their side. We handed them the uh, results of our modeling and um, machine learning predictions, and they simply created that and did the, the measurements of its performance um, so there was no tweaking going on between to maybe correct for what experts would expect to see. This is purely what the technology that we've built has created. Um, and we're very appreciative of the work that they've done validating uh, the predictions that we've made. And finally, Robert, what in your view should be the main takeaway? So I think what we've done with Magnex is show that we can upend the entire traditional materials discovery process. It is possible, as we've shown, given our team's unique expert skill set in AI and quantum mechanics, to fundamentally shift that status quo. It is possible to discover a material entirely computationally and have that verified experimentally. Um, but I'd note that magnets for us are just the start. So we are not necessarily a magnets company. We have much wider ambitions than that. We're a materials company that have chosen magnets as our first step. Uh, so I'd say watch this space. There's going to be a lot more interesting stuff that we're working on. We have a, a diverse pipeline of material candidates in different areas that are interested in like catalysis, uh, sustainable green hydrogen uh, semiconductors uh, that we want to apply our technology to. Um, and we want to ensure that uh, via these innovations that we're confident we will continue generating, we can accelerate the transition towards the net zero uh, economy globally. And we do want to be a global force in that transition. That was Kriva Media's Mining Weekly, speaking to Robert Forrest, the Chief Technical Officer and Co-Founder of Materials Nexus.